Hello everyone and welcome back to Oculus. Uh, this is our third installment and I'm happy to see you here again. I know it's been a while since I last posted. Um, it's been a, a ride for me. I'm now in New Orleans going, uh, getting ready for grad school. So you see new setting, new apartment. I'm um, happy to be here. Um, but I'm happy that we can continue this as well. This is kind of a bridge between the change and transitions in life, right, that I've moved from LSU to home with the virus, now to New Orleans. Um, but the Wonder of Faith channel has been consistently through there. I may not be consistent in uploading, but at least the channel exists and I can still give myself to it um, whenever I feel so inspired to do so. But I'm definitely, definitely um, committed to the Oculus project and I hope to continue it for the foreseeable future. Uh, so firstly, I want to address wh what you see me as now. You see I have a sash, I have my normal crucifix, and I have my seal here. Why am I wearing this? What does this represent? Well, I'm happy you asked. Um, so as you know, I am the keeper of Orderia, the wondrous orders, this rule of life, this charism that is uniquely mine, um, which I truly and duly believe that God has given to me so that I can live my life in a way that conforms to holiness so that I may reach sainthood as I move through life, slowly but surely. And so as the servant of the orders, I have a certain regalia or dress that uh, is fitting to that, that reminds me of my promise to God and to, to defend, protect, and propagate the orders and the holy Catholic faith. And so I'll start with the main uh, symbol, which is the sash. Um, Unique, usually a sash is worn on, the, on uh, the right shoulder and across, but I wear it on the left shoulder. There's a reason for that. On the left side of the human body, of course, is the heart. So the sash runs through the heart and the crucifix here. So my heart is truly Christ's. In fact, anytime I do the sign of the cross, you'll see me go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kiss to the heart. Because if we receive the Eucharist, and Christ is within us, where does he go but in our being, in our spirit, in our hearts? And so it's a symbol of from the heart where Christ resides, the whole person is claimed for God. So it surrounds my whole torso, my whole being, saying that I have been claimed for God specifically. Uh, and so with that in mind, it also passes through the crucifix, right? The, the ultimate symbol of salvation, of the gospel uh, truth, of the overcoming of death by the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. And so it, they parallel the heart down to the crucifix and then around back to the beginning again. And the third symbol is my seal, the seal of the orders. Uh, it is a wax seal and I've used it a few times. In fact, that little binder back there has some general orders that I've kind of uh, written through my life that kind of move me in the right direction having to do with the orders or uh, with relationships and things. And to make it official, I will take wax and melt it and I will stamp the stamp there so that the seal of the orders um, is pressed on there to make it official. And so this ability for me to govern self, myself, and to like to set forth this path that I'm, I may become better and holier, I think that unique ability for any person to have it should be rightly symbolized. And so the seal is that symbol for me. Um, now the reason I'm telling you this and the reason I'm just like this is because today I want to talk about two specific concepts and they're very much related. I want to talk about being set apart, but being communal. To be ostracized from the world, and yet being called to community with those who love God. They seem to be almost contradictory, but they're really not. And so the reason that I present myself this way, and I probably will for the rest of my videos, because it is from the office of certain of the orders that I really talk to you, um, to show that I'm set apart, right? You don't see people walking around dressed like this, right? With a sash or even with a crucifix and definitely with a wax seal in their hand. Um, but being set apart uh, is something that is difficult, but it's something that we have to get used to as children of God. Because as Christ says, uh, the world hated him first. And because they hate him, they will hate us also. Being Christian, being faithful, being Catholic is not always easy. It will require us to uh, be hated by some, to be misunderstood by others, and to be pushed away, to be mistreated. 
And it's not like you're being, you know, killed necessarily or persecuted physically. You know, there are definitely some Christians in the world that do go through that. And we pray in solidarity with them. And we do the best we can to make sure that injustice stops. But there's just small things in life, right, that we have to, we have to deal with. Um, Christians are becoming less and less a majority in this country, you know, more becoming less uh, non-religious. Um, but even among Christians, right, we have disagreements. We have those, these Christians don't like these Christians. And so there's always this tumultuous state of being ostracized or being uh, unaccepted. And that's painful for a human being. It's not easy, you know. And the gospel with Christ being the ultimate example of that, it's, it's there for a reason. It's emphasized for a reason. Because to gain everything, we must in fact lose everything. Jesus is, is renowned for his uh, paradoxical language, right? To be first, one must be last. And to gain everything, one must lose it all. But that's really the truth of the matter, isn't it? Um, when it comes to life in Christ. If the Christian way is easy, then there's a problem. Because it is not through the easy or the mundane or the mediocre that one becomes better, that one comes closer to God. It is through the pain and suffering that life may bring that brings us ever closer to our Father. And so we shouldn't be so caught up with being ostracized or being unaccepted that it just takes over us. We have this idea of vengeance um, and resentment that builds in us and then eventually will destroy us. We can't let that happen. And we have the power, the will to not let it happen. And the grace from God as well. So what we must do instead is see that we're not meant for the world, right? We may not have all the friends or uh, have all the social status. In fact, if we do find that we're very popular in this comfortable position, then we should really examine our lives. Like, am I doing something wrong? Am I being too accommodating of others and their falsity or sinfulness that I am just going along with it so that I can be liked? Because if that is the case, then we are forsaking the true and the good, the beautiful that is God, for the easy road. And that's just not what we're called for. We're called for so much more than that. And that leads me to part two. We're called to be rejected from the world so that we may be uh, accepted into the community, the kingdom of God. And this is where the beauty really sets in because we've rejected this kind of lowly sense of relationship, right? Like the sense of, you know, playing a part in society and smiling and, and like just being someone we're not for the sake of being popular or being in it in the clique. Or reject that for true relationship, true friendship, true calling to a divine community. Now, why is a community divine even more vital and good and profound? It's because if God truly is unity, love itself, that's which unites all things perfectly, then a community brought forth by God has that uh, aspect to it, right? A friendship born in Christ is much more united and strong than a friendship in a secular understanding of it. If we reject the world and the world rejects us so that we can then focus our mind and intentions on this greater community, then we will grow in that community. And this isn't to say that we just cut ourselves off from the world or like we don't talk to anyone else. No, we're not called to be private and like selfishly in our own little world. But if we give our hearts, if we give ourselves to people who will care for us and see our value, who will truly love us as, and strive to love us as a saint would, then we can be strong. We can be graceful and together we can compound this, this pursuit to God. We help each other get there. Not by uh, using someone else, not by putting ourselves first, but by completely pouring ourselves out for them as they do the same for us. It's very much like an arch where you have all these stones and the keystone in the middle is in which all the other stones are relying on because they're all pushing together like this. And without the keystone, they all fall down. They all rely, they're all pushing on one another. They're all relying on one another. So too with friendship and with marriage, of course, a sacramental uh, version of friendship or the deeper version 
we give ourselves wholly to people who truly love us. And sometimes they'll mess up. Sometimes we'll mess up. Sometimes there'll be hurt feelings. Sometimes there'll be pain. Of course, that's the way human relationships go. But it'll be true and authentic and real and good and actual. Friendship is not something to be whisked away. And I do talk about friendship a lot. Relationships are something that are very important to me. Uh, I very much have a moral mind. So I know a lot of your theological types. You can focus more on metaphysics, right? Like, what are the mechanics of salvation or, like, the essence of God? Um, but you'll definitely find in me a more moral thought. Like, how should humans act? Knowing the truth, knowing God and all that he is, how do we, do we then respond rightfully, uh, respectfully to God? And I think good Wholesome friendship is one way we do that. We come to know God by knowing those around us and their beauty, their good, and the gifts God has given them. And so I implore you, if you feel pain right now, if you're feeling like the world will never understand or that you've been wronged, that it will pass and that there is good yet to come may not seem like, it may seem very cliche for me to say that. It's like, well, it's bad now, but it'll get better. But it will. But not in this very shallow sense, right? Like, oh, well, your emotions will eventually calm down and you'll be back at it again. No. Our Lord who loves you, your Father in heaven, came down to die for you and has offered you his own body and blood for your salvation. If he's willing to do that, how... How can he not come to you in your moment of pain and weakness and lead you to something better, something that transcends all this now? It will. And, you know, it will get hard again in the future. Life isn't all about just getting happier and happier or easier and easier. But at least in the moments where it's hard, we know that something greater is yet to come. And so seek out people and pray for people to come into your life who can support you who can love you, and who can help you to become that which you were meant to. I know this is part three. Uh, Oculus, we're moving kind of in a progressional tone. So before we talked about ask the right questions, well, now we must surround ourselves with the right people. You know, everything falls into place so that then the ability to become a saint, to grow in holiness and truth and beauty and everything wonderful in the world, to thrive. It's a process, and having the right people is an integral part of it. Aristotle kind of fought with himself in his ethics, because um, there's two things he says. One, he says that friendship is good and should be pursued, and it helps one and another to help each other reach virtue, you know? And I very much wholeheartedly believe in the Aristotelian model of friendship. But then again, he says, well, ultimately, you don't need friends because you can contemplate your own existence and contemplate that contemplation. That perfect contemplation is the ultimate thriving. That is where you're trying to get to. So you see this duality, right? Like, I don't need friends, and I do need friends. Um, and I feel myself going back and forth as well, because if you have God, if you have holiness, what more do you need? You don't need others if you have him. But at the same time, how do you find God but through the other, through souls around you? Uh, it's true that we don't have to base our lives on the number of friends we have or who likes us and who doesn't. That's perfectly true. But if we want to harvest a garden, you know, if we want to put in work for God, that includes relationships, building something, building a beautiful stronghold that is friendship, that lasts, that stands through the earthquakes and the floods because you built it on solid ground. And so... I think there is a place for friendship, you know, and don't discount friendship, you know. So culture today really wants to say, well, just find yourself a girl or find yourself a guy and get married, and then that's great. But I do think friendship holds a special place, and perhaps even a place that romantic relationships cannot. And that is the pure, unphysical love and desire for the well-being of another. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. That's a very heavenly thing. In fact, friendship is a precursor to heaven, just as marriage is in its unitive act in a more physical way. But friendship in a very abstract, spiritual way, non-physical way, is mirroring this heavenly relationship that we are destined for. And so, as the world continues to frown upon you, continues to tell you that you're wrong, continues to tell you that you just have to be a little bit more normal, 
and you'll be fine. I'm here to tell you they're wrong, that you should not be ashamed of who God, who God made you to be, that through your own gifts and talents, your Father loves you, and those who love the Father will also love you, and they will see you for the beautiful person you are. So don't let them get you down. Don't let them make you hate yourself because you're worth so much more. You know, Put your own sash on. Be proud of who God has made you to be and who you pledge yourself to be to God. You know, Make a prayer of your actions. Follow what is good. Follow what God has given you. And, and just go to Him. So I know it's easy. I'm, I'm using very you know flowery language and it seems simple, but I'm sure those of you who've been through life know it's, it's a war zone. You know, there are scars on our souls from the pain and hurt that we have endured, but it's worth it. Find those people who will support you. Build your own community within the church who is your family as well. We are one large family held together by the glue that is Jesus. And so we can come to Jesus and we can come to one another to find the good that is in our life and really rely on one another. Thank you for joining me for episode three of Oculus. So to recap, if we want to be holy, if we want sainthood, if we want life to be filled with God and sanctity, solemnity, then we must go to God and we must go to those who go to God. So we can all point our wills together towards holiness and the divine. Uh, and it won't be easy, but uh, if you try hard enough and if you're patient enough, it can and will happen. You just have to have hope that God is watching out for you, even in the hard times. I'll see you next time on Oculus. I'm Anthony Bush, and this has been Episode 3. May God be with you, and may you find final victory in Christ.